brain, when it fires its thoughts, is likened unto the landscape of a thundercloud. And the synaptic cleft is the sky between the storm and the earth, the earth receptor site. And you see this foreboding dark cloud boiling in the sky. And you see electrical impulses moving through it, veins of electric light, and then you see it hit the ground. The brain looks like a thunderstorm when it is presenting a coherent thought. So no one has ever seen the thought. What they do see in neurophysics is that they see a storm raging around different quadrants of the brain. Those are areas that are mapped in the body and what the person must be responding to. A holographic image, rage, murder, hate, compassion, love. The brain does not know the difference between what it sees in its environment and what it remembers because the same specific neural nets are then firing. The brain is made up of tiny nerve cells called neurons. These neurons have tiny branches that reach out and connect to other neurons to form a neural net. Each place where they connect is integrated into a thought or a memory. Now the brain builds up all its concepts by the law of associative memory. For example, ideas, thoughts, and feelings are all constructed and interconnected in this neural net and all have a possible relationship with one another. The concept and the feeling of love, for instance, is stored in this vast neural net. But we build the concept of love from many other different ideas. Some people have love connected to disappointment. When they think about love, they experience the memory of pain, sorrow, anger, and even rage. Rage may be linked to hurt, which may be linked to a specific person, which then is connected back to love. We build up models of how we see the world outside of us. And the more information that we have, the more we refine our model one way or another. And what we ultimately do is tell ourselves a story about what the outside world is. Any information that we process, any information that we take in from the environment is always colored by the experiences that we've had and an emotional response that we're having to what we're bringing in. Who is in the driver's seat when we control our emotions or we respond to our emotions? We know physiologically that nerve cells that fire together wire together. If you practice something over and over again, those nerve cells have a long-term relationship. If you get angry on a daily basis, if you get frustrated on a daily basis, if you suffer on a daily basis, if you give reasons for the victimization in your life, you're rewiring and reintegrating that neural net on a daily basis, and that neural net now has a long-term relationship with all those other nerve cells called an identity. We also know that nerve cells that don't fire together no longer wire together. They lose their long-term relationship because every time we interrupt the thought process that produces a chemical response in the body, every time we interrupt it, those nerve cells that are connected to each other start breaking the long-term relationship when we start interrupting and observing, not by stimulus and response and that automatic reaction, but by observing the effects it takes, then we are no longer the body, mind, conscious, emotional person that's responding to its environment as if it is automatic. Does that mean emotions are good or emotions are bad? No, emotions are designed so that it reinforces chemically something into long-term memory. That's why we have them. All emotion is, is holographically imprinted chemicals. The most sophisticated pharmacy in the universe is in here. There's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is like a little mini factory, and it is a place that assembles certain chemicals that match certain emotions that we experience. And those particular chemicals are called peptides. They're small chain amino acid sequences. The body's basically a carbon unit that makes about 20 different amino acids 
all together to formulate its physical structure. The body is a protein producing machine. In the hypothalamus, we take small chain proteins called peptides and we assemble them into certain neuropeptides or neurohormones that match the emotional states that we experience on a daily basis. So there's chemicals for anger and there's chemicals for sadness and there's chemicals for victimization. There's chemicals for lust. There's a chemical that matches every emotional state that we experience. And the moment that we experience that emotional state in our body or in our brain, that hypothalamus will immediately assemble the peptide that then releases it through the pituitary into the bloodstream. The moment it makes it into the bloodstream, it finds its way to different centers or different parts of the body. Now, every single cell in the body has these receptors on the outside. And one cell can have thousands of receptors studying its surface, kind of opening up to the outside world. And when a peptide docks on a cell, it literally, uh, like a key going into a lock, sits on the receptor surface and attaches to it and kind of moves the receptor and kind of like a doorbell buzzing, sends a signal into the cell. It's party time! What happens in adulthood is that most of us who've had our glitches along the way are operating in a emotionally detached place or we're operating as if today were yesterday. What is it? Mixed. In either the disconnected place or the overly emotional reactive place, because they've gone to an earlier time in reality, the person is not operating as an integrated whole. Along the outside of the cell are these billions of receptor sites that are really just receivers of incoming information. A receptor that has a peptide sitting in it um, changes the cell in many ways. It sets off a whole cascade of biochemical events, some of which wind up with changes in the actual nucleus of the cell. Hi, when I grew up, I wanted to become a photographer just like you. Oh. Got any tips? Take that picture. Thanks. Each cell is definitely alive, and uh, each cell has a consciousness, particularly if we define consciousness as the point of view of an observer. There is always the perspective of the cell. A few years later, cell is the smallest unit of consciousness in the body. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Oh, yeah. We've come in here to the entire saving planet. My definition of an addiction is something really simple. Something that you can't stop. 